talks that we did were doing about the beginning of CoChess, which is a chess coaching talks platform. We did, we're doing and last week we had almost the same lineup as this week. This week we have, um, in addition to myself, we have Mikhailo from the Ukraine, Kostya from the South Bay in uh, California. And last week we had Jesse February, but this time we have Kroluka from Bucharest. And so, um, I mean, we're just going to go around and introduce ourselves and then we'll probably talk a little bit. We're going to give Reluca the floor so she can introduce herself. If you want to look back, there is a recording of this video that we did that you can access uh, on the YouTube site. Okay, so I'm in Baltimore. I am an older guy. I learned chess the old fashioned way with wooden pieces and a lot of my prejudices and thoughts about how to do chess come from that and we're going to talk more about that and uh, coaching styles and preferences as the show goes on. But I'll toss it from here down below me to Kostya. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Kostya Kavitsky. I'm an international master. I live in California in the United States. Uh, I've been playing chess for over 20 years since I was like four and a half years old. And I've been coaching for about Ooh, I don't even I don't even know maybe 10 12 years at this point it's been a while I started when I was a teenager started working with uh, kids and, and teaching classes and then moved on to to private teaching um, nowadays I guess my main chess goal is that I'm kind of working for the GM title which we talked a little bit about last week uh, but I really like coaching and I like the idea of helping others Kind of like raise their level and significantly get get better and all the growth and and stuff that comes from from that uh well let me throw it to uh raluca well hello everybody my name is raluca Sgircha. i know that's a bit difficult to pronounce everybody <laughs> has been trying <laughs> to do that <laughs> since we met um i am women international master and i'm from romania uh, i also started uh, playing chess from a very young age i started learning from my father. Uh, he taught me when I was three years old. I remember he took me to the local chess club when I was about five, but I was too young for that. So they sent me back home. And then I had to come back a year later. So I started playing at, at six. Um, yeah, I was quite uh, talented when I was a uh, junior. I was a European champion under 10 um, in 1998. And then I, I was fourth, I think, under 14. Uh, tied for third and well I since I had all these um, good results outside of Romania but then after I won my first uh, after I won the European title I came back to Romania and I could never ever win a medal <laughs> until I was 20 I don't know maybe the pressure so in my last uh, in my last year of uh, being a junior I won again a medal and I have to say that was probably the year I kind of stopped playing chess because I finished university, so I got a job. I worked for about six years, so that kept me away from, uh, from studying too much. Um, I kept in touch with chess because, I don't know, I feel like chess is such a, a big part of my life that I can never be really away from chess. I was seeing uh, games. I started also coaching kids. Uh, in that time and I think that's when everything started with coaching and then at some point I left work because um, I moved to Spain with uh, my fiance so yeah we started coaching together and now I'm very happy to be part of this amazing team that you have uh, <laughs> today okay cool um, we're gonna I want to ask you so much more but before we do let me just say Kosia has sent me uh, a calculation exercise. And I just wanted to put something up that people could, let's say, gnaw on as we're talking. So Kostya, why don't you introduce this position and then we'll throw it to Mihailo to introduce himself. Sure, yeah, this is um, basically kind of calculation problem. It's white to play. We're looking for the strongest move, maybe the strongest idea here. And uh, well, I'll let people think about it. I don't want to give away too many hints. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, we'll we'll be watching all the chats, guys. We've got 
we've got an eye on every single chat twitch youtube chess 24 so no comment will go unnoticed so send us your ideas and we'll also be taking questions throughout the show uh, especially anything regarding with chess or chess coaching and before I send it over to Mihailo, I want to say um, last week we talked at length about different uh, playing styles and such. Oh, I think I'm frozen. Mm, we can see you all right. I think you're good. Okay. Oops. No, he, yeah, he, he knew the problems were coming. Uh, <laughs> he knew it Jesse was, was going to say. Go, yeah. <laughs> go Let ahead. me clarify it is white to move for, for those asking in the chat. Uh, I guess you, you were talking. Oh, there you go. No, Jesse, you're still uh, still muted. Ah, uh, hello, Jesse's back. I yeah, we fine. see Jesse, but we cannot hear Jesse for now. Something happened with the mic, but mm -hmm. he'll be back. Yeah, I'll be back. Oh, now there we go. Back. Just for a second. Nope. We heard. <laughs> yeah, sorry. About okay, that. let me let me fill there in that go. gap. Introduce. Yeah, go for it, Mihailo. <laughs> I think that's good. Okay, my name is Mikhailo Oleksinko from Lviv, Ukraine. I'm a grandmaster uh, for many years. I even forgot that 2009. No, 2005. Oh my god, 2005. <laughs> I got my. Uh, I'm 30 plus years old and i've been playing chess since i was four or five years old and i never really stopped and i love the game till this day and i started teaching about nine ten years ago uh, seriously i would say before that i was teaching mathematics even a little bit to um, uh, students so i did already have experience uh, in explaining stuff to uh, um, uh, to a younger generation usually and uh, I uh, was a professional player. I'm still an okay. You cannot say I'm still an active player because of this thing called COVID. <laughs> so um, none of us are active players anymore. But uh, when the time comes, I would love to return to actual board, not the online digital board. And uh, and that's my short story. We can talk more uh, later. Yeah. And I love the tactical puzzle course. <laughs> I'm sure you solved it super fast. <laughs> <laughs> The first move I considered before I realized the correct idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesse, we uh, we still can't hear you. We we were able to there for a sec, but then it, yeah, dropped out. No. Okay, how about now? Oh, there yeah. we go. Now yeah. is much better. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. So we have Alvin from uh, the YouTube channel. And he's suggesting F5, Kosia. How do you feel about F5? Well, F5 is a really sharp move. I guess it depends on, on the follow-up, because F5 seems to just be giving away a pawn. And opening the G file. Yeah. yeah, so maybe black goes G takes F5, right, and opens up the rook against uh, white's queen. And Alvin didn't give us a follow-up, so we'll just wait on that one for a second. Yeah, That's what calculation part. is about, right? Not just saying one move. That's what you're trying to get out of the <laughs> <laughs> people here. Exactly. So, uh, Alvin's now saying queen e3 after gf. OK, queen e3 is serious. Let, let's put this on the board. So mm. Alvin wants f5, gf, queen e3. And OK, now that Alvin found this move, I'm going to assume that Alvin sees this queen is hitting the rook. Oh, I feel like I can do arrows, yeah? There we go and also threatening this mate threat. So everyone knows we call this uh, double attack very, very strong. And well, basically, black is black is lost in, in this position. Now, g takes f5 uh, is not forced, but this threat of queen e3 uh, is pretty devastating in the position here. And can I do the arrows? There we go. Uh, as well as now white has this positional threat of playing like f6 or f takes g and opening up everything for uh, the attack. Uh, so nice job. Nice job, Alvin. Yeah, basically, if yeah. you can play a five without being challenged back, you should do it. <laughs> Even if you don't see an immediate uh, outcome. So if like doesn't capture, that's usually great. If you push six, you can take, open the app file. So yeah, I love right. it. Yeah, so well done, Alvin. Yeah, that was good. Um, 
So uh, one thing that we did last week that I'd kind of like to pursue a little bit is we talked about what it'd be like to take a lesson from one of us and what our individual teachings, philosophies, or styles is. And um, so I got inspired because, well, Kostya is big. I know Kostya pretty well. He's big on calculation. And then what was cool about last week is we kind of got to dig into Mikhailo's past. And I didn't really understand before doing that stream that he was a student of Grabinski, who wrote one of my favorite books called Perfect Your Chess. And then it became clear throughout that stream that Mikhailo's like deep emphasis as a player and a teacher is uh, calculation. So look at this, you guys, I've been working on it. I've been working oh, on it myself. Oh, I know that book. <laughs> uh, yeah, I got up, I've been getting up early. I've been doing the puzzles, you know, and it's funny. I think like uh, there's, it's hard to write a calculation book, first of all, because telling somebody how to calculate I don't know if you can do it that easily. Like this book, it doesn't, what, what it wrote to me, what, what Agard wrote in the beginning about how to calculate, I didn't, it didn't connect with me at all. But basically, I'm using it as I did the Grabinski book, which was, you know, in the morning, take a couple problems, solve them. Don't do a thousand problems, you know, but just do a couple and do them right. And, um, that was anyways what I got out of the Gravinsky book. So I'm kind of like recreating that experience for myself with this one. You know, that book uh, brings me memories because I think uh, two years ago I had it with me in the national championship. So uh, I was solving like before the round half an hour, I was taking some of the positions there and was solving uh, a bit oh, wow. before the round. I had already solved, uh, solved it once. Like the first pages were just I knew them already. I know you were discussing about the memory and everything last week. And some of them I did, um, I did remember, but they were also very good for, you know, getting uh, myself into the chess mood <laughs> before the game. Okay, good. Um, Kosi, I just set up another one of your beautiful problems. So why don't you just <laughs> introduce it as, you know, white to move, black to move, whatever you Absolutely. Like to say. Yeah, thanks, Jesse. Um, yeah, this is white to play. Again, we're looking for the strongest idea. I would say there's nothing too, uh, let's say, amazing about these problems. I would say they're just kind of more or less, let's call them intermediate calculation uh, problems that people can can test themselves on. Um, they might bring up some interesting topics about how to teach calculation. For instance, I really want to ask Jesse, you know, what he does when a student comes to him and says they want to work on their calculation. Like, what would you what would you tell that student, for example? Okay. Well, one thing. Let me put it. Let me back it up because I was I had a lot of thoughts after our talk last week, and I think it's fascinating. First of all, both for us and I think potential people who are looking for a coach out there to think about what the different teaching styles are and like why they're different and why we all uh, have different focuses. And for example, when, when I, you know, dropped into myself and reflected on what um, I really believe, what I came up with was like my belief, personal belief about chess instruction is like, 70% of what you should do should be going over your own games. That's what I came up with. Mm. And I said to myself, okay, 10% is going to be going over classic games. 10% is going to be doing problems like, let's say, calculation. 5% is going to be direct opening stuff. And the other 5%, I don't even know what it is yet. I don't even know what it is yet. But in that that 70 percent and with the classic games i feel like you do get a lot of openings in there you get endings you do get calculation as well mm -hmm. so this was a long way to answer your question Kostya. is that how do they work on their calculation i really think that it comes the best way is when you look at your own games you're going to recognize that there were key positions that you needed to figure it out and if you can figure it out afterwards, like you're looking at it without any kind of computer and stuff, looking at the position that you had, you will identify when the critical moment is, which is honestly maybe the hardest part of it all to identify like this is the moment where I got to stop and think about it. And then you will gain a sense of how to tease out the solution 
and it's different than a, a problem like in this book, and I enjoy this book a lot, but it's much different if it's your own game because you had a personal emotional relationship already to that position that you can come back to. Okay, so let me use that segue to have Raluca just try to tell us what her teaching philosophy is and um, maybe just paint us a picture of what it would be like to take a lesson from you or a bunch of lessons from you. Sure, yeah. Um, well, I have to say that I started working with kids, so that was a very different way of teaching things. I am still working with a lot of uh, kids, with uh, groups of kids. Uh, so, yeah, that's where you kind of need to learn how to draw their attention to uh, invent all kinds of games, to know how to explain things to them, how to make them simple, uh, find, um, uh, you know, some stories from their life that applies to chess. Uh, but later on, I also started with uh, training with uh, higher level uh, players with adults uh, who mm -hmm. are were trying to improve and um, well I'm, I'm still trying to improve my my coaching but what I, uh, I normally do is uh, ask them to send me some of their games uh, I look through them try to understand what kind of player they are um, see the weaknesses and well from there start uh, uh, getting material and preparing some some plan for them. Okay, good. Now, one interesting good mm -hmm. difference between us, I think, is, and I hadn't thought about this uh, until <laughs> last week, is we're, we actually have a different uh, set of people, kind of students that we're teaching. Mm -hmm. For example, I think Mihailo is mostly teaching people who are over 2,000. And yeah. I feel like I'm teaching everyone though though i try not to teach the kids too much because it, <laughs> it makes me lose my mind i can't do it too much but basically i feel comfortable i do feel comfortable in teaching from beginners to on up um, and i think coast is the same but i'll let him speak for himself um, and so that already i think presents an, an interesting difference because for sure teaching kids it's its own special art form yeah, I had to learn uh, from the very beginning. It's completely different, yeah. Uh, yeah. A kid won't pay attention to the whole hour. You have to uh, make it interesting all the time. No, basically, right. the stories that I had to come up with are fantastic. At some, <laughs> some point when yeah. I remember, I'll have to <laughs> share share one of them. Um, uh, for sure. Go ahead, Kosiu. Yeah, maybe I could hop in. Uh, we've got Captain Flag in the Twitch chat solving the uh, the puzzle. Uh, and Jesse, I'm gonna send you the next one. You can get that uh, ready. Okay. So here, okay, in this position, I mean, white is starting out uh, a pawn down, but has some like peace activity. And uh, yeah, Captain Flag found the, the very nice uh, knight g5 here, uh, bringing the knight to attack the pawn on f7, obviously a sacrifice and seeing the idea hg queen f3 once again hitting f7 and the black has no way of defending their their king king can run away but only for for so far that queen is gonna gonna take f f7 um so okay, nice good. job nice job i also want to give a shout out of to um 98 impossible also found knight g5 with queen f3 on the youtube channel so that was cool all right, uh, Kosi, I'm going to load the next one, and then you... Oh, oh, did I get... Yeah, and then it should work. Oh, wait a second. <laughs> Let me make sure I got it. Um, good. Kosi, one question that we had there is, yeah, what... I, was I correct in saying that you are teaching basically all levels of player? Um, well, let's see. I don't work with beginners that often. Just to be honest, I don't feel like I'm that skilled in teaching uh, beginners. I think that takes just like we were saying, like a special kind of talent, like working with kids. I think working with with beginners and breaking down fundamentals in in, in a way that makes sense to people who, who don't play chess. I think I'm really good at talking to people who understand chess, at least at some level. But mm -hmm. below that, it's like it's very difficult for me, I think, to to communicate. 
so I would say focus on, let's say, intermediate, maybe 1200 and up. Um, and I, I work with actually quite a few adults nowadays, uh, definitely a lot of kids, but I would say maybe even at some point it was half and half between adults and, and, uh, and kids that I was teaching. Right. Something uh, for myself that's changed, just an insight that I've had uh, recently, I think the development of social media has actually helped me understand this, is that, you know, for years I always wanted, as I'm sure most teachers, chess teachers want, is they want some ambitious young kid to teach to, you know, point to later in their old age and say, oh, I taught this young buck how to play and, you know, and now he's out there beating everybody in the world. And that's still a dream, but something I've discovered in the last, I want to say, year is just how interesting and difficult it is to improve when you are older. And uh, I've just had that experience teaching several uh, older guys who, like me, you know, I'm also an older dude, uh, have really big trouble improving at, an, at a late stage. So it's like in the same way that there's a feeling of epic challenge when you have a young kid and you can see their rating graph go up, there's also an immense challenge. If, for example, Mihaila was going to teach me, and like, if we just moved that rating graph up just a little bit, it would just be a massive improvement, you know? <laughs> so it's like I, what I've learned, and I've seen it, what I mean by social media is you have so many guys who are older posting on Twitter and all kinds of places. They're really like very involved training regimes that they are going through to improve their own chess. Um, and you can see the struggle. That's what social media has done for me to see the struggle of these various players. And it doesn't matter whether they're 1200 or 1600 or 2000, it's the same struggle that they're going through. And it's very tough, especially like, I'll speak from personal experience, but also as a coach, like when, when you hit a plateau and everybody's going to hit a plateau to get off that plateau oh man that's then it turns into a very interesting personal struggle yeah mm. personal journey Absolutely. can i because, can i share my i'm oh, sorry just go ahead go ahead i yeah, thought please. i want to jump in with my story because that really <laughs> spoke to me when you said that okay good about yeah. hitting the plateau uh but here i'm gonna talk as a as a player uh, mm -hmm. but a valuable lesson for for me as a coach would be uh, mm, uh, I hit my plateau in 2000. It was not a plateau. It was down the hill. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was falling down the hill, <laughs> not just staying at that level. And um, uh, for example, I had uh, all my life. I was playing uh, with black. I was playing um, first move knight f6 for black, except of e4. I'm not that uh, kind right. of player. I don't play alakine too much for me. <laughs> so, but knight f6, and then I never put a pawn on d5. All my life it was Nimzu Indian, New Indian, uh, we call it New Indian, what, what is the English? Uh, King's Indian, yeah. Uh, not King, King's Indian, I started later. Nimzu Indian and, uh, oh my goodness, d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight f3, b6, what's that? Queen's, Queen's Indian. Indian. <laughs> Queen's, okay, we have New Indian in Ukrainian <laughs> language, so that's why Queen's doesn't come to mind. So basically all my life, I never had a pawn uh, on d5 with black and I never played d4 with white myself. I was exclusively an e4 player. So what helped me personally jump off that plateau or in that case, okay, I fell very low uh, for, at least from my perspective. And then I went up very quickly. What helped me if you're stuck, it helped me enormously, completely new pawn structure, mm -hmm. completely new that I never played with any color sounds silly i have no experience there right like how would you but i would say you can recommend it for uh, my significantly higher than intermediate level although if it's it's a child or a teenager with a coach help coach can help explain all the ideas of the the new pawn structure so what helped me i started playing slav with black it's not famous for extraordinary it's not like the famous opening at all it's not grunfeld it's not neither if it's not that kind of top level it was just yeah. slav just regular slav not even the main lines not even the main sharp lines like i would take dc4 at some moment and give up the right. center and uh, and it was a, such a pleasant experience for me 
it was so easy to play with the pawn on b5 with black, even on grandmaster level. I was grandmaster mm -hmm. for a few years when I did that. I had a pawn on d5. It's so easy to play <laughs> if you have a pawn on d5. I'm uh -huh. used to not yeah. having pawns in the center. <laughs> and I never had experience playing this with white. So it was completely new and interesting area for me. I got the insight, uh, I got excited to play again. You know, new pawn structure. I never had it. Ooh, it's so interesting. It's like a new uh -huh. toy for a child, you know? Like, uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> no, that, and, is, uh, that is cool. And, and it worked. I, I checked the statistics. The first three years when I started playing Slav for Black, my rating was like 2550. That was my average uh, throughout those several years. And my performance was 2650. So, and it's not like five games or the sample was more than 20 games. And I performed like 100%, 100 points above my level with black, which is with white is enormous success. Play 100 right. points <laughs> above your rating every game on average. Right. And it was with black and the, the opening was not, it was not a like great opening. Mm -hmm. No, it was just a new stuff for me. I got excited and very interesting. And it uh, brought, uh, I, I was so happy to play it. Then people started to prepare and find it holes in my preparation but the first three years that was like honeymoon was right right you know that Completely reminds because me because i never had that bone structure with either color so i would say that could be an advice for those uh, at least it worked for me so I no, that, that reminds everyone. me for uh, i remember that uh, my fiance was to, trying to do something similar because the same thing was happening to him knight f6 what do i do and the advice was oh just put a bone on d5 and defend it and play the position <laughs> you know something like that so yeah <laughs> probably the best advice put up on d5 and did defend. it work it did work yeah <laughs> okay good <laughs> <laughs> no i think that's so true Mihaela. i i feel like uh learning a new structure helped me break out of like two separate uh ruts like or two mm. plateaus uh one when i was uh like i got to 2200 playing the french and i was really solid and then i got stuck there and uh and then i remember uh coach said you know you need to just put the pawn on e5 actually it was a very similar experience <laughs> like you like playing with space is what he told me like you like space uh -huh. so just put the pawn on e5 on move one <laughs> <laughs> and and that was really hard because for a french player you don't want to deal with like all these gambits and open positions like f4 d4 scotch gambit evans gambit all these different lines so i had to go back and like relearn all these like classics and that was hard at first but then i feel like i just immediately shot up mm -hmm. uh, and then i feel like i was very much stuck for maybe a few years at just like i don't know 2360 2370 with like one or two im norms trying to get the the title uh and then at a certain point i was like i need to play the king's indian because <laughs> i was just playing like the nimzo every game and i i was just kind of tired of playing those positions as white a d4 player i struggled against the king's indian like i was always getting an, an advantage and then losing I was like, I need to learn this opening from Black's point of view, and maybe that'll help me. And then I feel like I, I got to the IM title very quickly once I did that. Interesting. So you struggle for a little bit, like learning the new positions, and then you, yeah, you just turn out a completely new player at the end of it. So I totally with you. I think it's so much so worth it. Let me let me do a couple questions from the audience here. Cleveland Chuck asks. Who's the guy with the glasses? Well, I'm GM Cry, <laughs> and then next to me, below me, is Kostya Kavutsky. No other people with glasses. Also, another interesting question um, from Ritvis Prab: uh, Isn't a 1200 as good as a beginner? And what's interesting about that question to me is I think that's a common misconception. And as someone like Verluka, who has taught children, I will say that you could be you teach children and you yeah. are going to start off around 300 yeah and you will work for years before you get to a thousand and yes, if you get exactly. to 1200 then you you've got somebody of then. course yeah yeah you can yeah, work it with takes that. a takes a long time to get to 1200 so uh yeah i definitely think 1200 is not a beginner though mm -hmm. i remember i don't know 10 15 years ago i might have also said that that a 12 I don't think you had 1200 back then, did you? I, I remember I didn't. Rating started on 2000. Yeah, I remember that. I started from <laughs> 2000, so I have no clue what you are talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. I don't have experience yeah. teaching beginners. So, so. 
Well, right. I should, should clarify. You know, most uh, countries have their own rating system, and oh. so here in the U.S., you know, we can start from 300 or whatever. You know, and uh, you know, England has its own rating system. Germany does too, and I think mm. all of those. Be right until you get to FIDE. It used to be you had to get around 2,000 yeah. for FIDE, yeah. uh, and um, now I don't know. You can 1,600 or whatever it is. But in general, right, all beginners don't start at even close to a FIDE rating. They start to something like a 300 or whatever yes. it is. Yes. Yeah. Or even just don't even know how to move the pieces. That's that's also. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. That's a beginner. That's, <laughs> that's a that's real a beginner. beginner. Yeah. <laughs> that's a beginner. Yeah. Alika, do you have tips for, well, let's say there's people that are stuck at just, let, let's call it just a really low level, like 500, 600, and they feel like, you know, they solve puzzles and they play and they try, but somehow they just can't like improve. Like, what would you, where would you start with kind of like a new student who seems to be stuck at, at, at like a low level? Uh, well, I've had such cases and I think uh, the, I, I, can, I can get the, the most information out of their games. But usually I think that a common thing that I notice in lower level uh, students is that, as you say, they, they look a lot of, at tactics and maybe a lot at the opening phase. And most um, of them have problems with positional understanding. That's uh, usually the most common area mm -hmm. that, uh, that I've encountered that needs to be worked on. Uh, and basically from there, we start working, looking at classical games, structures, uh, weaknesses, positional exercises, and everything I can I can find and, and recommend them. Mm. Cool. Um, Makes sense. But I guess One everybody's question. different, no? I mean, that's, yeah, that's right. just, I think, I think there, there are many, many approaches. Yeah. yeah, I think it all depends on the case uh, in the end. Well, now I'm working with Sophie, who's there in the chat, and I saw her, so I have to say hi. And her biggest problem yeah. was on the openings. So now we're working on openings. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. A question we have here uh, that would you know, be a case study, you could call it, is uh, from Ritvis, who asked earlier a question. He says he's at 2,300. I'm assuming it's a he. I'm not sure. Uh, and he asks, how does a player who has never really worked on chess or never had a coach start working and, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So wait, we have, okay, uh, two questions there. So there's that. And, you know, that's actually a very interesting question. I meant to actually read a different question, but I want to start with that one because um, when you ask, how does a player who's never really worked on chess or never had a coach start working? Th there's a lot of things that are interesting about that. And the first thing that's really interesting is the person who asked that says they're 2,300. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, you'd normally assume that somebody who's 2300 yeah. <laughs> has had both a coach and has done a lot of work. But I don't know too much about this person, of course. What I will say that's very interesting about these new COVID times, where pe and also for years people are playing online, is there are people who have, just by playing online and doing puzzles and yada yada, who have improved their game quite a bit. And so, for example, I've been approached to teach people who are around 1,900, 2,000, and they've never even played an over-the-board tournament. You know, it's just stunning to me. <laughs> it's stunning to me that you <laughs> could get that good and you've never played what I think of as a real game. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, hmm. So it's it's a funny question, um, especially, it's, it's actually, Ritfis, I want to say it's hard for me to imagine, actually, that you're 2300 and have never done anything. I suspect you've done something. For right? sure, 2300 yeah. is not uh, come, <laughs> <laughs> I mean. <laughs> That's nothing to sneeze at, you know, yeah. Um, one thing I wanna just introduce that goes along with that question and this other question I'm about to ask from the audience is, you know, we're, we are part of this new CoChess platform and uh, it's just beginning. And one of the things that's really interesting is right now, there are various resources that players can use. In fact, just a ton of resources. And I mm -hmm. think part of the problem for anybody out there is just deciding what to use. 
uh, in my own students, for example, they're telling me about all kinds of websites they're using, and I can't even keep them straight in my head. We've got Chessimo, Chess Tempo, uh, Chessable, all of these sites out there. There are many more to mention. And I, a lot of them, I just don't even know. Um, but uh, the thing that I think is interesting for us is that we have on our site, we have uh, potential for a database. We have potential for a connection to Chessable because CoChess is related to Chess24. And um, so here's the, I'm gonna read the question before I get into it too much, you guys can respond. Please give advice on learning how to use databases and chess base generally. And I'm going to turn that to you guys, but I want to say, as a consumer myself, I feel like chess base has not kept pace with the times. It is crashing. It is crashing all the time. It is slower than I think it needs to be. And I feel like some site, whether it's chess.com or chess24 or somebody, is going to come along and have an online version of chess base to get it done. But I'm going to throw that question to you guys. Well, um, Hale, do you want to take this one? I mean, you're you're definitely working with chess base all the time. Yeah. Um, I only use chess base, so I don't have any frame of reference, you know, what to, to compare it to. Um, chess base 15 currently, I think that's the newest version. Um, yeah, it, it can crash, uh, but I again, I don't have anything to compare to, so I'm just okay with it. And um, I think you can use it for engine, Stockfish, and uh, storing your own databases, your own games, or selection of games that you find interesting. And of course, Megabase to prepare for, for or online database to prepare for the opponents. Although I'm not sure how you can use an online database to prepare against opponents. I really like this button when you go to Megabase or any database that you open in Chessbase and you go to a player and then prepare against, mm -hmm. and then you right. can see the statistics, the, the last time the player played this. Um, I think they introduced this feature at version 14 before or 13, and before that it was not available. And I remember I had so many failed preparations for, for my opponents because I was using just select all games into a book and then I would just start go from there. And then I didn't even check that my opponent hasn't played it in, in years. <laughs> it's still a big number, but it's outdated. And, I, and then now if you use prepare against button, it's very convenient You see the last 10 games he played this. That must be the one, even though there could be 100 or some other opening. So uh, preparing for your opponents, assuming they have games in database. So it depends on the level. Um, and uh, storing your own games. I. Um, many players don't have my games database. I s strongly encourage my students to have one. So you, you just collect all your games you ever played with at least brief analysis in, in one folder. And that's very useful because uh, somehow we all remember something from all the games we ever played. We have some sense, most of the games. I, I, I was checking recently my own games from a long time ago. And I remember lots of them. Of course, not the moves, but the, the idea, the, the sense I had. And some games, I have no, I have zero recollection. I'm like, yeah, I must have not been thinking hard when I played those games because I, I'm checking the games from, from 20 years ago. And I, I remember that I played that boy in 2000 to Ukrainian championship, and he beat me. I remember something like that. Yes, yes. So, And there are some games from even several years ago. I'm like, I have no clue what I was doing. No recollection. I think it's the level of concentration that uh, was the factor here. Uh, but yes, store your own games, at least brief analysis of the opening and critical moment. That's like bare minimum, I would say. I'm sure I Jessica think that's I would, the, uh, would, would go much further than this suggestion. Right? I think that's the experience some people have from like Woods games they play like yesterday. They just like, they look at the game and they're like, they have no, <laughs> <laughs> no recollection of what happened or what they were thinking. Yeah, I'm not talking about this game. I'm talking about serious chess, and I still have no recollection. It's like I well, did from something 20 years ago. Yeah, 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 sure, but right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, maybe I could step in and talk about this uh, problem. I feel sure. like Captain Flag in Twitch solved it once again. Very nice. Just see, I'm going to send you the uh, the right. next one as well. Um, so yeah, this is a 
cool position to really like this one. In fact, all these poems so far, I'm taking from this one book, a uh, pretty famous book, Imagination and Chess, you guys mm. may have mm. may be familiar with. Yeah. Um, really great problems, especially for teaching like certain like techniques and methods and calculation. This one is a really class a classic one that uh, the author refers to as like reciprocal thinking that I like to work on with my students. Uh, where you see this position and like the the patterns in your brain like immediately light up whenever you see like the bishop uh, aiming at the h7 pawn. And immediately a lot of players are going to be thinking about this Greek gift sacrifice. But once you start calculating, you see, okay, bishop takes h7, king takes h7, and we don't have our favorite follow-up move, knight g5. It usually is the way to, to win in, in this attack. Um, and then if we analyze why, we see, well, queen is covering this square. Then if we take a look around, the astute player figures out that, well, if we start with this move b4, we can actually chase this queen away from e7, just due to the fact that the bishop is going to be, well, drawn to, to b4. Basically a deflection idea, pulling the queen away from you know, e7, but once black takes this one and takes again, White is able to execute the sacrifice, and now this is uh, absolutely winning. Not the easiest attack to calculate, but long story short, when the king goes to g8, we put the queen on h5. When the king goes to g6, queen comes to g4, and white has all of their pieces ready to uh, basically checkmate the king. Rook can come into d4, you can get the h-pawn involved, the f-pawn, and yeah, black's king is toast. Can I ask you something? I very often get confused. You know, how do you know if there's no dark squared bishop, how do you know that king h6 loses? It's like almost always losing, but it still fascinates me. How is it losing? So I guess I guess queen g4 is the move uh, after king h6, right? Yeah, uh, no, that's actually yeah really good question because it, it's not always obvious, but I would say the main idea to look for uh, along with queen g4 is the follow-up uh, I gotta get these arrows right. Queen g4 check, uh, king g6, and queen h7. So this is white's big threat, forcing the king to come up, and then basically you mate the king with your queen, your pawns, and maybe your rook. I think there's like a million ways to check. You can go f4, h4, rook b4. It's like, um, but if, as long as you're okay with giving up your knight and pulling the king forward, then you you should be able to find uh, a mate there. But I would say a recommendation to, to the players, you have to check all the three moves all the time. There are yeah. multiple examples in various books where, where the king just goes forward. And somehow queen g4, it's quite typical, for example, I would say that when the king goes to g6, queen g4, it's quite typical the f5 move. Mm. And very often the capture doesn't work somehow because, let's say, e5 comes with a tempo from the bishop, hypothetical bishop to the queen. But very often quiet move queen h4 can win because there are the, mm. the threat that you just mentioned, queen h7 with, uh, with the checkmate. But you always have to check all the lines to make sure that, uh, that you're not missing anything important. So you cannot say, oh, come on, it's a famous sacrifice. No, you have to look at details. For example, here after yeah. queen g4, if let's say black took on the pawn on e5 with the knight, mm -hmm. that's it. Right, knight takes e5, the queen is hanging, you don't have this, so always check for details. That's what, what yeah. I would say. That's a good point. You don't want to just rely on like thematic ideas. Uh, honestly, and, to me, and maybe I'm, I'm really yeah. sorry. One more thing bishop h7, king h7, knight g5, king g8. It's very typical. People very often blunder. King, uh, can you please move the king to g8? Because somehow when I do it, it's not working. King g8, queen h5. Very often, uh, king g8, yes, king g8. Oh, weird. Uh, and uh, and uh, queen h5. Very often, if the queen or the bishop can go to b1, h7 diagonal. That's it. Black just wins. Yeah, sorry, I'm having trouble making... Oh, there we go. Yeah. Uh, black just wins if the bishop or the queen appears on the diagonal, protecting h7 square. That's it. That's Like it. if That's we could play one. queen c2 now. Yes, if black could jump, queen it turns into a knight for just one move <laughs> and, and jumps to c2. That's it. Black is winning. Queen g6, next move, attack over, right? That's it. So you have to be careful. Or that bishop from beach seven magically jumps to that diagonal. The attack is completely stuck. So there are a lot of subtle details behind this combination. So you shouldn't shouldn't assume it's just working. I just check my yeah. g5. That's just an idea, a direction 
before. It's such a it's such a Calvary. tragic comedy when when someone like calculates Bishop H7 for 20 minutes and they see King G6 and King H6 and all the lines, uh -huh. and then they forget that Black has a knight on like D7 that can go to F6 and King just goes back to G8. <laughs> it's just like resigns, right? <laughs> yeah, it's almost always with the pawn on E5. It's quite mm -hmm. rare that. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think it was game eight of uh, it was uh, Anand had uh, uh, it was like a Nimzo against Carlson and he had this crushing attack on the king side and then right it was like a bishop on c2 save the day on h7 and oh man that was a big win by Carlson that kind of sealed the deal back in the day in the first that when he took the title away from Anand. Okay I'm going to put up this next position on the board and uh, also a question Here's, there's two parts of this question that interest me, uh, but there's a detail the first we're going to talk about. Would you guys agree with Capablanca's advice that one should first and foremost study the ending? And then asked by a guy who saved a difficult rook ending today over the board against a 2200 player. You are a lucky let me player. Just, <laughs> yeah, let me just say what an amazing thing that you played a game over the board today. Um, <laughs> It's, you know, from here in the U.S., it's amazing to even dream about playing an over-the-board tournament. Um, so I just want to say that that's really cool. And I've, I've seen a couple other countries. We, uh, me and Costa are involved with a website called Chess Dojo, and there people were saying they're playing games in Israel, in Austria, and I'm like, wow. Iceland. I think yeah, Iceland. On that list, yeah. Yeah, there's lots of... Anyway, so that's just an interesting um, detail that people are playing over the board. What do you guys think about this ancient advice about studying the ending? Well, the way I see it is that, um, I don't know if you really have to take it uh, literally, but the way I see it is that for people who are just starting and trying to improve, uh, not to focus so much on the opening like many, many people do nowadays. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, what do you guys think? <laughs> I would say maybe um, uh, I see a lot of uh, similarities between mathematics and chess uh, mm -hmm. in the sense how you should study it. And um, uh, so one thing is this one. When, when, you, when you put all the pieces for a beginner who barely knows how pieces move, he or she would definitely be confused, right? Mm -hmm. So the first step is just to figure out uh, to, to be very good with handling one piece or two pieces. Mm -hmm right then you can increase the number to more and then you become more more sophisticated at doing that so uh, uh baby steps i would say L like in mathematics first you have numbers one two three four five six you know that's you what i actually them. do with kids so what you just said i don't start with all the pieces <laughs> yeah because when they confusing. are real beginners yeah it's very confusing like what 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 sh should i do it's so there's many so many choices. pieces yeah i don't know exactly, which one exactly exactly yeah so from that perspective, I think for, for total beginners, that's, uh, I think uh, without that, it's quite, quite difficult to, to get. Like uh, recently, I was taught one, one new board game uh, where there are so many things you can do at once. And they say it's, it's a simple game. And I'm like, I'm very confused. I have no clue. I have no frame of reference. What, should, what is a good move? What is a bad move? I have so many options. How do I build any strategy? But, but if you take small steps, then you feel, and uh, I think there's similarity between uh, studying chess for beginners and uh, studying tactics. So for example, uh, since I'm working with advanced players, I'm not, uh, uh, I recommend to, to do puzzles when you have no hint whatsoever. You don't know the topic, you don't know the theme, you know nothing, just go ahead and solve the position. That's the attitude. But that's mm -hmm. a bad one in my point of view with beginners and children. Uh, again, just like with numbers, in mathematics, you learn the numbers, you add them, you subtract them, then you multiply them, you divide them, then you get fractions, then then you can get to adding uh, multiplying fractions, then you get irrational numbers, and then you put it all together, and then you have more, much more advanced chess. But you have to be great at adding and subtracting before you go to multiplication. Otherwise, it's already confusing, because multiplication is like really good... Uh, adding of numbers. So the same as calculation, I would say first you have to learn the patterns, like this is a pattern, and do a, let's say 100 positions on one pattern, when you know the pattern in advance, then you become really good at recognizing that pattern, and you move to another one, 
um, and you become great at doing that, then uh, you don't have a hint anymore, right? And then next level, combining the, uh, the patterns. That's like, that's like taking integral in mathematics. Like if you take small steps, you'll get there, you'll understand it. But if you miss a step, no chance you're gonna understand more even quadratic equations. Uh, no chance you're gonna understand that if you didn't go all the line, if you're not great at doing that step separately, it would be very hard for you uh, to comprehend uh, with lots of pieces on the board or no tactical pattern or hint whatsoever. At least that's my perspective, uh, how I see it. But for advanced players, I'm assuming that work has been done. <laughs> so that's my side, so I don't have to worry about that. Um, well, I should just introduce this position that Kosia gave us. I'm, I'm assuming this is white to play. It's a nice one. And it's actually, to me, there's a lot of ending tactics. To me, this seems like what you could be called a practical ending. And one thing I want to say to the person asking the question, Khan, is that uh, when we talk about learning endings, it's kind of tricky because most people, when they hear that, are thinking about what I call algorithms, right? They're thinking about the stuff you'd find in the Dvoretsky manual, like how do you checkmate with a bishop and knight? Mm -hmm. That's very important. Uh, but this kind of position, now here there's going to be a tactic for white to play and win. But learning how to play this kind of position, and tactics are always a part of the ending too, uh, is a real skill and I think really translates to other parts of the game because what it really teaches you is to think about good pieces and bad pieces when you play these kinds of practical endings. But I just want to get say uh, to the to in, in Kava Blanca's honor uh, that Kosti and I do a stream every Sunday night. So actually we're, after we're done with this one, we're going to do another one. And we have a guy on there. He This guy is rated only 2000, but we are certain that his opening rating is around 2500 maybe 2600 oh wait jesse let me let me stop you hold on his yeah go ahead no no his official uscf rating is yes yeah. maybe 1800 yeah maybe so just there we shy go. Of 1800 yeah there we go i mean this guy is amazing an adult <laughs> improver i mean already kind of an interesting thing anyway that, that this new thing where you have somebody improving somebody who's done a lot of chessable courses like a lot and lot of chessable and um, has gotten through Chessable very good at openings. Like he knows a lot of theory. He has a lot of very nuanced ideas. Um, but the thing that we're seeing, first of all, I think he's better than 1800. Like I just want to say he's improved enough in the last six months that we've been watching. Him. Uh, that I, I just want to say that from my experience, he's at least 2000. But still what 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 you're basically what you basically have and you see this in a lot of players is that if you could see him physically like if you were able to see his chest in a body an incorporated body what you would have is like huge muscular biceps which would be his openings and they would just be like bulging they'd just be bulging out like this just huge and they'd be looking at you and like when you everybody's faced this guy over the board and there's somebody's really scary in the opening and the first couple of moves it's like what what you want to taste me you know and it's very frightening but then if you were able to look a little deeper at the guy's legs they're just these tiny spindly legs with nothing to stand on and i think that's my experience of a lot of players and i think that was capablanca's uh, feeling too is that there were a lot of people who uh, had mastered just in in an un, in an undue weird proportion the opening and maybe sometimes tactical face of the game but then their endings were so weak mm -hmm. so weak that they what we're observing this is one of the interesting things about this stream that goes to do and i do every uh, sunday we're really watching games of students of people we know but players who are not gms we're looking at 2000 2200 levels is they get to the ending and they don't know what the questions are, like what the questions to ask are. And we can see that because they move so fast so in fast. the ending. They think that they know the answer already. That's like they see the some end game position. They're like, well, this is obviously what has to be done. <laughs> and then they whip it out. And it, and it seems like it seems like you could say, OK, Jesse, we'll just tell the guy that and he'll stop doing it. 
well, no, we've told him many times. We've chastised him. We've publicly shamed these players, but they are still making the same mistake. Um, so I have a lot of sympathy with the idea that the ending has to be learned. But what that learning is, is kind of an interesting thing. I, I, I want to stress, I don't think it's just learning what I'm calling the algorithms. Mm -hmm. Learning bishop and knight versus king, that's going to help you. But it's not going to teach you how to play this kind of position that Kostya has up. For example, I would call this a Fisher ending of rook and bishop versus rook and knight. Very interesting, dynamic thing uh, that learning how to play actually takes a lot of skill. Anyway, I'll leave it there. I talked too long. <laughs> I, want, I want to add one more thing about uh, um, a student that is like really good at something and really bad yeah. at something else. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm usually trying to do, so I'm, I'm working with uh, advanced players, of course. And uh, as you said, if you're like, everybody has like, let's say maximum level they can possibly achieve. I would say, mm -hmm. and the closer you get to it, the harder it is to make that small improvement. Even ten points of rating or twenty could right. be a big deal, right? As as you were saying, Jeff. So uh, what I'm trying uh, to do, I'm of course like I think uh, any teacher is doing uh, check um, students' games, right? To see problems, to see the weak spots, to ask the questions. What uh, of course we discuss the games, um, asking like why did you play this move, especially if that move was a mistake. Uh, but uh, what I'm usually doing is, uh, well, everyone, anyone can use Stockfish these days, right? Mm -hmm. You can just check the game with Stockfish. It will point out all your mistakes, which would be like 10% of the game would be a mistake or 20 uh, or an inaccuracy. And you don't get any lesson from there except that you're a bad player. Uh, <laughs> I'm talking from my personal experience as a right, player, right, right, not right. as a coach. Yeah. <laughs> so that's like the only lesson. Thank you, Stockfish. <laughs> go away <laughs> and if you so, do that uh, during a tournament it's even more depressing yeah <laughs> yes that's true so during the tournament i'm trying to do uh i'm just checking my opening phase mm -hmm. just to if i had a problem i need to fix it today or uh, in the worst case tomorrow because this literally can happen this the next day and i need to have the answer so but what i do with with my students uh, is uh, i i check uh, i take their long time control games because blitz is nonsense you cannot draw any conclusions from that maybe bullet maybe i should check their bullet <laughs> games so, just kidding I'm, I'm not a fan of bullet so and then i'm checking them with stockfish stockfish points out all the mistakes and then i'm actually picking the mistakes that i find valuable stockfish will always find all kinds of inaccuracies and i'm like I don't understand why is that a mistake mm -hmm. so i don't care about that mistake and i'm looking for mistakes that that are repeating themselves so for example i see there's a pattern you know like worst place piece was not improved something else was done and i'm like and i see uh, several games and usually you can spot that pattern quite quickly like as if you're stock for sale that move was better and i'm like why is it was better here here so i basically i'm putting human explanations to what stockfish is trying to tell and and i'm choosing only the ones that repeat themselves there's, there's a valuable lesson like the the wrong pawn is being pushed or like multiple blunders like you should work on your calculation right if you keep blundering there's nothing i can do just i can help you what to do how to do it but then you do hundreds of positions yourself and then you become better but when it comes to more sophisticated chess i'm looking for patterns like mm -hmm. a bad decision with a pawn or the wrong piece being improved or the queens were exchanged where where your opponent's king was weak and you exchanged the queens and you went to the end game, stuff like that, that, that you can extract the lesson that you can take to the, another game, right? If you extract the lesson, I made a mistake here, that move was better, who cares? You know, you haven't improved the, your chance to finding a sale. So I'm looking, and that's really hard. I cannot do it in my games, I cannot do it. I can do it in my students' games. So you need somebody from outside to look with objective eyes like what what is the pattern and when i spot that pattern and i i help my students like this is how we're gonna fix it that's an improvement is uh, around the corner if if you fix the pattern not just one mistake in one day so that's at least that's my attitude Good yeah. Answer. Yeah. Let, let me jump in i think we have an answer I don't know the answer officially. Kostya can tell us if we're right, but Klaus I've seen Sandholm. all those positions. I'm sad, Kostya. <laughs> <laughs> Klaus Sandholm writes in. Some of them. Mm -hmm. 
He writes in E6. I'm, I'm just going to say, Klaus, I think this feels right to me. Hmm. And he goes here. And then king, let's say, C8. And now rook C4 with the intention of rook C1. Let me see if I can get fancy arrows here. Rook, oh, my, my fancy arrows aren't working. Anyways, rook C1 <laughs> after that to trap the knight. And did he get it, Kostya? Is that correct? Yeah, nice job, Klaus. This is right. So we go back one move couple moves here just to explain Klaus's idea the issue for white is if we start with this immediate rook c4 which looks like we're just trapping the knight right away with rook mm -hmm. c1 black does have a nice way out it's kind of a puzzle in itself but black yeah. can go rook b8 rook c1 and now nice. knight c2 using the back rank and freeing the knight and and now black is uh well very much okay uh, right. So, very tricky puzzle. I'm sure you guys can imagine, not just in your students' games, but in your own games, you know, you would just play rook c4 here, you wait for your opponent's resignation, and <laughs> then you see rook v8, and you're like, oh my god. And you're worse <laughs> after that, you're pulling down, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just, you know, game over, you, you're like, yeah, why did I spend 40 hours on Tactics Trainer if I can't even find rook c4, mm. uh, rook v8? Mm. Um, well, I... I think this is what makes these kinds of problems really useful when yeah, some opponent's resources are included as well. And if you can avoid these pitfalls, then uh, yeah, you can catch so many players and, and be really successful. So for this reason, e6 is really important to throw in as after um, if we had gone rook d4 check immediately, uh -huh. trying to get the king to go to the back rank, king gets to uh, just come out to e6, right? So no issues here for black. So white starts with e6 to shut down this route then gives rook d4 check. King e8, rook d8 is no good. Black is forced to go king c8, blocking off the rook. And now after rook c4, white is catching the knight and winning the game. Yeah, and I want to point out that in the starting position, it's like immediately you see that the knight is in huge trouble, right? But you also should see uh, flaws of your own position. The only flaw in white's position is back rank problem, right? Tactical flaw. Uh, the bishop is maybe not well placed, etc. But from tactical point of view, the back if the, there was no back rank problem, if White had a pawn on h3, just rook c4, easy win, right? So be aware of your own. You know they say uh, you don't see. A, I'm not sure what is the English version. So you see a, a problem in somebody else's eye, and you don't see a huge stick in, in your own eye. So be be aware of your own problems as well before you before you jump to to conclusions about it about the situation on the board. Yeah, absolutely. Jesse, I just sent you a new puzzle for the audience to work on. For me to work on. I'm enjoying these. These are fun. <laughs> yeah, oh, great. we are improving our calculation as well. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You know, I will have to do, I'm yeah. doing a lesson on Tuesday on back rank issues. So I might steal your problem just to show how, <laughs> how black uh, might survives here. Yeah, yeah, by all means. Yeah, back rank is a lovely topic. You yeah. can you can have only one rook left on the board and you <laughs> win. <laughs> Your opponent can have all the pieces, you're still going to win. <laughs> Jesse doesn't respect the back rank mates. He thinks they're all easy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's an, OK, that's an inside joke. We better explain it. Costa has started this thing, guys. This is amazing. We talked a little bit about this uh, last week, and this is one of just the key differences between different styles of teaching. Now, one thing, actually, I'm going to just back up and say, last week, Raluca, we had Jesse February sitting in your chair. She is very young. She's like 23 or something like that. And Costa, of course, is a young man himself. And one of the obvious differences when we were just talking about uh, how to teach and how to st how we studied ourselves was just the puzzle uh, rush. I know the debate. <laughs> I've seen the debate. Yeah, <laughs> is that it? Well, I'm just trying to say, you know, the difference <laughs> was obvious between the younger uh, Jesse February and Kostya and myself and Mihailo. That yep. we were. I'm very, in your generation <laughs> in this, in, on this one. Yeah, we were very much. You know, we, we use a board. There's books. There's maybe a notebook. I'm with you, know. you on that. Sorry. <laughs> I was like, right. yeah, yeah, the board. <laughs> I really, the board. you know, I, <laughs> know. <What's that? laughs> 
<laughs> I don't believe in books myself, the younger generation. No, no, I should say, yeah, Kostya does read a lot. I don't want to say that. But anyways, so Kostya started with this other young guy named Elijah Logazar, this challenge to see how fast and accurate you could do the puzzle, the three-minute puzzle rush. So not the five-minute puzzle rush, but That's the three-minute. people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they were doing, you know, and the, the joke was that when you try to do it like that, the first 10 problems are usually back right me. So how my joke with him was like, how is he gets he really getting better by doing 10 very quick back rank mates? Okay, we have a new problem on the board. This one looks tricky. And Jesse, I want to one quick uh, reference to what you said previously, you use the uh, yada, yada, yada reference. Uh -huh. And I think only I understood it because I watched Seinfeld. <laughs> I think <laughs> I got it too. I got it. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Oh yeah, yada 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 came along long before Seinfeld. Yeah. Really? Okay. Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I knew it catch, catched on after Seinfeld. That's what I was always thinking. It's good that we can uh, see U.S. cultural imperialism expanded <laughs> in the history through Seinfeld. <laughs> that's a good. That's a good ambassador for us. Okay. This one looks tough, Kostya. Oh man, you get it. you're you're stepping it up a little bit here. It's a tricky one. Yeah. yeah. Huh. So That's now a, mo a moment of silence for us to so. think, right? <laughs> if you see us, <laughs> if I we're not speaking, it's because we are trying to figure this out. <laughs> yeah, I've been very nice not putting anyone on the spot. You know, like, oh, yeah, Jesse, why don't you share the? <laughs> <laughs> no, hold on. But the the ones before they were like. Uh easier but hold on this one <laughs> you're taking us i'm prepared now <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe maybe stepping it up a bit well i want i want everyone to feel like they have something to to uh -huh. work on i know chess 24 actually is usually pretty popular with like the uh, the higher rated players i imagine because mm -hmm. um well one thing yeah we definitely could talk about actually is the uh, the magnus carlson tour finals i don't know if you guys watched the the final matches but those were extremely yeah. exciting <laughs> Um, but one thing I try to mention a lot is just how instructive I think it is to watch commentary from people like Yasser Sarawan or Peter Laiko. Uh, when I was around 1800, I would watch a lot of Sarawan doing commentary in St. Louis. And, and I, I thought I, I, I learned a lot because I, I felt like, I don't know, I, it was 1800. I clearly didn't have huge positional understanding or positional touch. But when you listen to like Yasser Sarawan talk about chess for hours and hours, I think you you develop certain instincts that are probably like pretty healthy for, for your game. Uh, I mean, he has this like reputation as a pawn grubber, but I, I think that's like totally, you know, uh, oversimplification. Like he's always focusing on like piece play and putting his pieces on good squares and fighting for the initiative when it's appropriate. And yeah, I feel like I, I learned a ton. And lately from watching Peter Laiko, I think mm -hmm. it's an absolute like treat. <laughs> we have Laiko doing commentary for like hours and hours and we can just watch that endlessly. Hmm. He was almost a world champion, I think, in 2005, right? He just needed that draw with Crumb. That's right, yeah. Slav. It's like one, you know, yeah, one solid that game was away. <laughs> one solid game away, and Crumb capped his title. Uh, just, uh, I think the, the rule was there was no tie break. So if a draw, that's it. So he was actually plus one before the last round. And Crumb needed, by the way, a fantastic positional match. Mm -hmm. Crumb Nick Lacko, 2005. People should look it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a second. Okay, I'm not going to give much to it. <laughs> That's how old I am. 15 years ago, I remember the games. <laughs> so I'm in your generation, Jesse, for sure. <laughs> yeah, great game. Well, we have one attempted answer, but I want to say, uh, so Karem writes in that A3 is the answer. Now, maybe it is, but if you uh, submit an answer to this difficult problem, try to give a couple variations yeah. That's what uh, Mikhailo's coach Rubinsky would want. He wouldn't want <laughs> just one move. He would want a little bit more. He'd want a little bit more. And I yeah, think and all of us. If you get it wrong, <laughs> if you want, if you get it wrong, you have two puzzles. You have to solve. <laughs> tell it. Tell yourself why you are wrong, and then solve again. So, I like that approach. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, by the way, I'm okay with putting me on the spot because, uh, for example, uh, the puzzle with knight g5, I was a fan of h5 move in that position, followed by knight h4. But I didn't find it too convincing, and only then 
Mm. H5 was the first move I considered with queen g6 mm -hmm. idea. G takes h5, only move, and then knight h4 with the same idea. And uh, I think white still has a promising position, but of course it's not winning. Uh, yeah, if I remember correctly, I think that's pretty good for white too. I couldn't yeah, see I... a defense. Queen f3 is coming, queen g6. But that was, was my sort of a solution. I didn't, so it's it's really good to, to see Grandmasters fail uh, live on live television. <laughs> so yeah. go ahead, you can put me on the spot, yeah. <laughs> No, but it's really unfair because, uh, I mean, I don't know, it's kind of a weird problem, but like, I think, well, as you get stronger, if you don't know the level of like the puzzle in front of you, you might see a solution that kind of looks correct and just kind of assume like, oh, okay, I guess this is probably it. But if someone tells you like, oh, this is a really difficult problem, then you're going to be a lot more careful and looking for like resource. Or if they say like, oh, it's an easy problem. Then you're not going to be too like if you see something like it looks good mm -hmm. you're just going to kind of assume like okay it's probably it so i think as a stronger player you have the disadvantage of seeing more ideas from the start and like <laughs> so it's like you i mean are probably very much used to getting things right so once you see something that looks correct it's i mean you have a lot of confidence in yourself right so why would you yeah. why would you reject that idea yeah yeah uh, and um, i would love to be wrong by the way it would give me a valuable <laughs> lesson for myself. You know, how nice. come I didn't see it? You know, like what happened? Why? Why didn't I see it? It's so normal, and it's really good to to be aware of your own uh, problems when it comes to to calculation. I I love that last week. I think you said that when your opponent beats you, you should thank them, right? Yeah, <laughs> especially if they beat you in a blitz game. I'm super <laughs> grateful. Okay, I'm angry. I'm angry, but I'm grateful. <laughs> <laughs> and no, if I, I get beaten in the opening, in the, if I get beaten somewhere late and I blunder, no, I'm just angry. But uh, <laughs> if I get beaten in the opening, I'm like, thank you. That's a valuable free lesson. Yeah, that's a good point. So we have one answer. Uh, let's just see if Kostya thinks this is, this is right. And that is knight c7, mm -hmm. king d8, bishop d2 wins the exchange. Okay, well, let's take a look. So yeah, knight c7, I'm sure is the first move that comes to, to everyone's mind. And I mean, usually the game is just over if we get this kind of check, um, but things are not so easy. So bishop b2 is an interesting move uh, here for sure. The I guess the main point that um, probably people have already figured out is that things are not so simple for white if we take the rook because black gets this knight with check. Black was already a pawn up to start the pawn from the beginning. And now after the queen moves away, bishop b2, queen will go somewhere. Knight on a8 is, of course, stuck and caught. And yeah, white is currently up the exchange, but the situation is really unclear. And if we lose the knight, then we're going to be down a lot of material. Um, so this line being not that clear means white has to figure something out. Because after knight c7 check, of course, uh, both knights are hanging and not clear what white should do. Um, and so this is what I like about this problem is that I think most players in the game, they might see knight c7, king d8, knight takes a8 is not very clear. And and so they kind of reject the line altogether. They don't look for any options along the way. They end up playing rook b1 here, a3, bishop b4, bishop b2, one of uh, these other moves. Um, but once you know that there might be something to find, yeah, you look for additional ideas and bishop d2 is very clever. Um, okay, well, let me put one of you guys on the spot. What is white doing after king takes c7? I'm guessing that's me, no? <laughs> I, you know, yeah, you're right. I was asking for it. Yeah, that's exactly the line I checked, and you need to see that you have to give it the knight b5 check. Don't mm -hmm. so take knight the pawn automatically, because that's way too many pieces for the queen. Three pieces are better than the queen period. That's like 95% accuracy. So that's completely wrong, and you have to give, have to give knight. You have to see the knight b5 check, uh, and then you just win the queen for just two pieces and one pawn, which is not enough for black and white as well. Very nice. Yeah, it's heartbreaking when I have a student that gets this far, and then I'm like, okay, and what's your move here? And then they even think about it, and then they still take on d5. It's just so <laughs> tempting, you know. It's like. Yeah. They know they're going to win the queen with knight queen. d5. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and, and it's a queen. knight d5 is a fork just to be sure that you win the queen. You double it. Yeah, attack. exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, very nice. Very nice. 
Uh, well, okay, let me... I'm going to get the next one real quick. Yeah, go ahead, Jesse. I was just going to show a position uh, oh, or, or a game, I guess it could be. So I was, I said, I always, by the way, my memory is terrible. And so I said it was game eight of the Anand Carlson match 2013. It was, in fact, game nine. I was close. I was close. <laughs> and this was a fantastic, uh, interesting game, especially because Anand really did build up what seemed to be a really nice uh, attacking structure. That's names of C4, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it looks very, I mean, it just is very dangerous for Black to play this way. And I still, to this day, I believe in white. That's the final position, game. right? That's the final one, yeah? When you mean the, what do you mean the final? Ah, you ju I just seen the final. Okay, that's fine. Yes, I'm listening. So, so this all happened, but Black must get rid of the bishop and it looks look at that e5 oh my god f4 is coming it looks like mate and honestly i think you know i remember doing commentary with on this game and it just seemed like white was winning this thing and he might actually be winning this game but let's just check i thought of this game by the way because earlier we looked at the greek gift position with bishop h7 and mihailo said uh the def you know you always have to look if black can defend the h7 square and uh, there we go h7 i got it highlighted so we're gonna see there's a magical h7 that, so just when he said that my mind came uh -huh. to this position again it looks completely winning for white yeah this is so scary so here we go knight e8 to control g7 queen h6 now what anand was calculating this and must have felt must have felt he was winning if he had won this game, it's not clear that the whole course of history would have been changed <laughs> if Anand had won this game. So he missed something, and that is b2, rook f4, b1, and the terrible, terrible problem is that if knight f1, black has queen d1, queen. rook h4, Queen H5. I think you meant Bishop F1. In this Bishop line. F1, excuse me. I'm Bishop sorry. Bishop F1, yes. Let's do Bishop F1. Bishop F1. Queen D1. Rook oh, H4. Can you can you replay that again? Because the pieces are yeah. not yes, moving. Yes, yes. Are I they think... moving now? I think. Yeah. Bishop, Bishop F1, right? It... Rook H4. Queen H5. I think you have to promote the line and then it's fine. To the left. Yeah. Uh, do we see it now? Yeah, yeah, yeah we do. We do. Yeah. Oh, it happens. Yeah. It happens when you enter a variation sometimes. Right, right. Anyway, so this was this. This didn't happen because uh, obviously a non assad and a lot of, of course, in a lot of classic games, you, you know, the key ideas you don't see them on the board. But the point was just that we give this queen back up, and it's not mate because this bishop on uh, c8. Yeah. <laughs> that hasn't moved the entire game gets to go to bishop <laughs> f5 and there uh, there's applause yeah from the public <laughs> the bishop enters the stage <laughs> on move 31. <laughs> That's right. yeah so anyways I think, yeah i think there was extremely extensive analysis on one of the russian website with it's even hard to figure out on powerful computer with stockfish whether that attack was successful Right, no, it's very difficult. It's really, yeah. even with they're, the engines, they like yeah. they are like, whoa, I have no clue what this is going We don't know either. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. yeah, and it's interesting. To this day, I think of that position, and I think white must be winning. It just looks so overwhelming. But there's all kinds of dirty tricks like that black has, like this uh -huh. one, where you're magically defending the pawn. It's a, it's a great um, visualization exercise, too, because once the pawn's on G6, a couple moves back, yeah, it, it's hard to imagine that you're ever going to be able to talk to the H7 square. Mm -hmm. Very difficult to imagine. And somewhere right way back here, uh, this is when, you know, I, I assume Anon just, well, we know that Anon felt he was winning in this yeah. position. Uh, but already here, it might already be difficult to hold for white simply because of that trick. Hmm. I want to take it even one step further. Mm -hmm. I when when Magnus played g6 he had to see all of it yeah yeah because g6 yeah, right. is not an automatic move there's some like knight e8 movements or some other moves g6 mm -hmm. is not a must and after this this is the only move this is the only move 
this is the only move and you have to see up, up until bishop f5 right. before you play g6 because this is the most straightforward line you can imagine and he must have seen it so and unfortunately it's all left behind the scenes when when you watch these games without commentaries right, or right. Uh, just just from mega base you're like yeah okay I, I want to give one more position. Uh, I, I, uh, it's a famous London system trap, I would say. So I will just throw it in the chat. You can put it whenever okay. you feel like. I'm going to give away, uh, for, uh, I guess, all all the tutorials on London system. All the open, I'm sure they all have that position that you're about to, to, to okay. see soon, soon on the board. It's also the same topic, the H7 square. Almost there. Uh, right. uh -huh. Oh yeah, I know this one. <laughs> this is uh, this is Kamsky Shankland. Yes, that's true. Awesome. Kamsky yeah. Shankland. Yeah, that's this the was first a... one. Uh, maybe there was one game previously, but mostly that's the one. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, Actually, this is a stunner. This is a beautiful tactic. What yeah. the first time I saw it, I was like, "There's no way there's a combination here. The position is right. so normal." Right no chance it's it's uh, there's combination there is actually stockfish doesn't see it at least till certain depths here when i upload it it doesn't see yet you have to give it some time to to see stockfish has problems with bishop h7 sacrifices right Costa? <laughs> yeah i can show some nice ones <laughs> <laughs> Right, and it's so. Uh, what's the the beauty, of course, the hint we'll give is normally when you sack on h7, the knight is closer to g5. <laughs> but now it's still <laughs> that's on a d2. good hint. That's a good hint. Yeah. Yeah. It's still surprising to me till this day, to be honest. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah okay, let's nice uh, give some time to for our viewers to sink in what we just said. <laughs> so h7 square, knight is far away from g5. That's it so far. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one thing actually, it's interesting to reflect back on this particular game is uh, Komsky was playing the London forever and he was very good. He was kind of like a early Carlson in a lot of ways. Komsky was very good at technical positions, very good at endings, very good at fighting it out to the bitter death. And one thing that's interesting about this game to look back on is the the theory of the London has exploded so much since the days in which Komsky was playing it. And Komsky had come up with ideas like this one that we're about to see. Mm. And now it's just stunning how many players are playing the London. Mm. And one interesting thing about the London is we've had we've had a lot of debates over at the chess dojo. We have a we have a guy who really despises the London. Not only does he think it's bad for your chess, but he thinks you will ultimately become a terrible person if you play the London. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, but I think one of the things that's interesting is if you're at the level between like. 800 and 2000 and you just want to play up some positions it what it gives you is a sim very simplistic way to just get all your pieces out just get your guys out and you're going to be fine and you're not going to lose instantly in any kind of miraculous way so anyways i just wanted to give that i felt like because this game was one of the top, first top level games i remember where something was like a knockout in the london it wasn't just like some Mm -hmm. technical squeeze or something this was like a full blown knockout. and uh, Costa I think you started something with Carlson Nakamura match and somehow we, we went some other way did you finish that thought or <laughs> oh yeah I was just wondering if you guys found that match exciting I thought it was just very fascinating to watch um, I mean, mean the, the final about... one the draw the fortress <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> no everything was yeah <laughs> <laughs> no, I would say just the whole match was uh, just just really interesting to see uh, the the chess they played. I thought was at a really high level. Um, yeah, uh, I mean that's been one of the highlights I think of the the quarantine season. <laughs> Definitely. The new chess. 
Yeah, I'm sorry, I had a lot on my plate I did not watch. I just briefly watched the games for some opening stuff, and, and that was it. But the final Fortress by Magnus, of course it's a joke that uh, he doesn't believe in fortresses. That's like, that's a joke, obviously. Of course they exist, he uses them. He just, uh, <laughs> that particular uh, game from Karakin, I think that's when he said it, uh, after he broke a fortress. No, broke a fortress, that's the right way to put it. <laughs> he doesn't because that was not a fortress there was like some position that's fortress like but it's not really a fortress a fortress is like you look at the position for five seconds and it's obvious to you that it's a fortress <laughs> that's a fortress anything else is is a play you know yeah well i, th I think that's what magnus kind of means uh you guys you know the famous um philosophical question like if a, if a tree falls in the forest and no one is there to hear it does it make a sound like this question <laughs> I think there's a similar question. If you're not able to break through someone's position, is it a fortress? It's like maybe objectively there is a way in, but if you're not able to break through, then to you it's a fortress. So I think what Magnus is saying that he doesn't believe in fortresses, so he's just going to break through. And then, okay, maybe 1% of positions, yeah, hold, and that's fine. But I think if, if you're not optimistic during the game, then you're less likely to win. I think that's kind of what he... So I don't think he was talking about the fortresses from Dvoretsky and Game Manual or like uh, the, the well-known ones uh, that no one can break, basically. He was talking like fortress-like positions, but basically take all your chances, press to the best of your ability for 100 moves, and all the opponents will collapse, most likely, if you keep the pressure and if you believe in the position. And you create, uh, uh, there are fortresses that you can break, but uh, if, if it's not really a fortress, if it's an equal end game where there seems no way to improve or penetrate, you can create small problem, problems and people will collapse under pressure uh, eventually because they are not machines. Yeah, no, definitely. Okay, I have uh, one suggestion from okay. uh, Twitch. Uh, which uh, is an interesting suggestion, so I'm just going to put it on the board. Uh, they want to go bishop takes h7. Mm -hmm. Queen h5, check. Uh, the pieces are not moving, Kostya, so you might need to oh. refresh oh, or something. Weird, oh, yeah, because. There... Yeah, they're moving for me too. I okay, yes. Mm. Yes, now they are moving. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, Nadia falls up knight f3 with the uh, threat knight g5, so line continues f6, then bishop takes d6, queen takes d6, and h4. Mm -hmm. So very imaginative, like h4, I'm guessing with the idea of knight, knight g5 and sacking a second piece to open the h-file, uh, but likely not working. I think black is just defending you. We get knight g5. There's bishop takes. e8 here. What about bishop e8? No? Just try your Yeah, queen bishop e8, for instance, can can defend. Basically, too, I would say too slow for white, right? Not, yeah. not working. Yeah, usually such long ideas do not work, especially if you just sacrifice something. If you play a move with an idea and then with an idea, knight g5 is not winning in that position, right? Hmm. Yeah, I, I want to for a second come to this position. Ironically, e5 is a great defense. Opening the diagonal, we talked yeah. about. <laughs> so knight g5, yeah. there's bishop f5 or capture if you want to do it first, right? So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so you have to, you sh you're looking in the right direction, but try try to look at the board. Yeah, points for being on the right track. We are asking you to basically make bishop takes h7 work, but yeah, yeah. you got to. You gotta be it's more clever about easy. it. It's not that easy. It's not easy at all. Shankman no. blundered it during the game, so it's not an easy one. Maybe uh, that's too difficult for our stream, but we'll see. That's why we're giving <laughs> some hints. <laughs> it is difficult. It's a very difficult one. Yeah, I, no, I would have blundered it too, too, for sure. Yeah, if I never seen it, zero percent. You're going 100%. To see. And yeah, if it's in a blitz it. game, even, <laughs> even better. On the other hand, if you've seen it once, the, the idea of exec so queen h5, knight g5, um, I'd say most of players know it, but the way it's being executed here, you see it once, you're like, whoa, and it's like right there with you forever, I would say, <laughs> if you're shocked, you know. We actually remember ideas much better if there are some emotions connected to them. Like somehow, we, if there was no emotion, you will forget it. But if you are shocked or angry or happy, mm -hmm. somehow you're like, oh, that's a memory. That's right. Yeah, I agree with that. 
Um, one thing I want to say about the Magnus Carlsen match and a lot of these other matches that are happening online is, uh, and uh, uh, well, first of all, it's just been this incredible new development in the last couple of months that we have so many people engaging with chess in a way that just didn't happen before. Hikaru is streaming. Uh, other people are streaming loads of interest and people watching on a level that we just hadn't ever seen before. And I think one way it relates to chess coaching is, well, we're getting a lot of players now who are interested in proving who have not played a lot of over the board chess. Um, in fact, maybe never. And they are getting good in ways that uh, are just new, right? Like for example, listening to people talk about the games or maybe li listening to Hikaru talk about his own games, or maybe it's doing uh, chessable, which is a, a, to me a very brand new way of studying chess or doing other online things. You know, they're so different from older school models that uh, I kind of identify with, but I, I don't, you know, think are the only way. Um, so I think what's what it's inter what the most interesting thing to me about the match and kind of like what it represents is how things are going to develop in the future for chess coaching because I definitely feel we're at this cusp and it might it's even hard for us to see like we're on, I feel like we're on the edge of a brand new world of chess coaching where new technology is going to come in and um, we don't even know exactly how it's going to look you know we don't know what's going to be popular or, or effective and um, so I just want to throw that out there the, it, and maybe people have uh, you guys have some thoughts about what dreams could be had for players out there in terms of how to improve like ways to improve that are different from what came before but definitely what i'm seeing with the Komsky, uh, or excuse me the carlson hikaru match was you know just a totally new engagement with chess and people learning from it. yeah yeah i agree no but something that uh, i think um well i feel at least uh that the, the human touch is very important because many people just go go ahead, use the engine or just read books or, uh, but for me personally, at least it has been very important to have someone to guide me because for example, I'm playing a tournament and a coach is not there only just to look at the opponent's games or just to give you advice for an opening. But, uh, for me, it's very important to be confident and that's what a coach does most of the times before the game. Uh, they tell you, no, play this line and you're going to play it because there's someone much better who knows stuff and who's telling you to do that. So you're going to play that confidently, even if uh, it's maybe the first time you're playing it over the board. <laughs> so uh, that's one thing. And then I think a coach can also guide you. Like um, you have so many books. Uh, there's so much material that you can learn from. Uh, so many theory books, but you don't know which line to choose. Like there's so many to choose from. How do you know which one's good? But if you have a coach telling you, look here, this this line is easier to learn. No, don't go there. That doesn't go with your style. Um, yeah, just uh, things like this, small things that I think uh, nobody else can tell you, but the coach. <laughs> That's like, I I'm not going to go to a doctor. I'm just going to go to YouTube. To Google, yes. For <laughs> Google, YouTube, I don't need them. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I some will... simple stuff you can fix yeah. by google and youtube but uh, a little bit deeper no you shouldn't yeah you something that. like that go to yeah. a specialist yeah i yeah. feel like a doctor very often during the lesson I'm trying to see <laughs> where's the problem where does Absolutely. it hurt yeah. You know? uh -huh. yeah yeah that's right yeah you're like, yeah and so i i've been watching these like opening dvds lately and you're like there it is that's the problem <laughs> 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 I think we should. Uh, I'm just gonna put the the first move. Um, yeah, I think we've got um, Captain Flag with the uh, with the solution over on Twitch. Okay. Um, and I should mention, I think it, at least the idea, maybe not the full variation, but a, a truth be told on YouTube, I think also has the general idea. So why don't you show it to us here, Kostya? All right. Yeah. So we got Bishop takes d6, Queen takes d6. 
Now d takes c5 first. There was some debate over the move order, but it's very accurate to take this pawn and ask if Black's queen wants to just recapture. Now, I'm going to share with the folks a fantastic trick. I don't share this a lot, but it's really useful and it could win you a full game. Let's say you know what's going to happen if Black plays queen takes c5. You know that it's a blunder, right? So in this position, we all understand that Black's best move is probably something like queen e7, you know, just giving up the pawn and continuing. Hmm. But you don't want to tip anything off to your opponent that, like, they're about to lose the game when they calmly recapture the pawn. Interesting. Uh -huh. So this is something you can only do over the board. It doesn't work in online chess, but I did it once in a similar position. <laughs> Worked beautifully against 2200 player. Yeah, you make your move, d takes c5, you write it down. And you wait and with the pen, yeah? You leave your pen in your hand, right? <laughs> <laughs> Inhale a note. <laughs> That's some dirty tricks you are teaching yeah. there. <laughs> and because, because normal rhythm is like you write your move down and you just drop your pen immediately because you don't know how long your opponent is going to wait on their move, they might think. But you leave your pen just showing them like, oh, your move is obvious. Like, I'm not even going to, I'm not even putting my pen down. And people see that and they feel it and they recapture the pawn because people are nice and <laughs> don't want to keep you waiting. They trust you. <laughs> so you're feeding of this, they are good nature. Yeah, okay, that's a good lesson. <laughs> and when they do play queen c5, that, then we hit them with bishop h7. Yeah, fantastic shot. Okay, now chess 24 engine finally understands that white is winning once we <laughs> put it on the board. That's Green always the case. Chess. When you put right. it on the board, then you say, like, oh, yes, yes, you're right. <laughs> I see it, yeah. <laughs> One uh, and now the please. Key yeah. idea, knight e4. Beautiful. Finally getting that knight to g5 at tempo. It's still actually not the end. Of, so the idea, of course, is if the capture, we lure the queen into, <laughs> into the trap, right? So, but uh, I, I like to joke that this isn't checkers, right? So you're not obliged. <laughs> No offense. To, okay, some offense, I guess. <laughs> so here's the. I think the main line should continue like this. Queen goes to b5, knight g5, and queen d3. Exactly what we were talking mm. about. The queen right. appears on that diagonal, and you lose unless you find one more move for one, which in this case would be e4. Closing nice. the diagonal one more time. If you don't do it now. The queen just goes to g6, as we pointed out previously with the bishop h7 stuff. e4 closing that diagonal yet again, and uh, white is winning uh, f7 if you have at least a perpetual, you keep on the attack. Uh, actually, I think the line is even deeper, but uh, we found uh, that is the one. And I, I would say if, if, for example, if that was a puzzle I was solving myself, I would be like, if I didn't see e4, I don't count, I did it. That's mm -hmm. the, the main move, that's mm -hmm. the killer. I have to see it. So there was a discussion like whether you do it quickly or if you know the puzzle is difficult, uh, if you want to improve the, the level of your calculation, not the speed, you should assume all puzzles are difficult and always look for details and chances for your opponent. It would take more time, but uh, make you a better player when it comes to, to tactics and calculation. Yeah, actually, Mikhail, if I can ask you a quick question, it always amazes me when I see um, like strong GMs playing in an open tournament, and sometimes I'll see like they they have a completely winning position. Maybe they're up in exchange, they're checkmating their opponent, uh, and they have like maybe plenty of time, fifteen minutes on their clock. Their opponent has two minutes, and the GM will like they'll think on their move for a couple minutes, even if they see the win immediately. They see two wins immediately. It's like they're still spending time, and they're even if they calculated everything before, they still like double check. Do you do you do that as well? Do you just kind of like double check and you know don't take? I chances? really try to do it. I really try to because I suffered a lot from jumping to conclusions, missing uh, and surprising defense, and then starting all over again. I've been there many times, and so uh, yes, you should do it definitely. Everyone should do it, not only GMs. And uh, the reason I give for it is this one. Um, and for example, as you say, the automatic move queen takes c5. I think you should always take at least a few extra seconds to double check. Because uh, I don't know how about you guys, but during the game, I have this over the board. It's only over the board. So if there's an obvious move for you to play and you don't play it instantaneously, the worst case scenario, OK, if you, if you don't play it instantaneously, take a minute to think. In the worst case, your opponent would think that you're stupid. 
<laughs> well, right? That's the worst case scenario. Your opponent would be like, what the hell are you thinking about? Best case scenario, you see a brilliancy like this one and you don't fall for it. He moves the queen and the game continues for God knows how many moves. And the same goes for a winning position. If you think that you're about to win, you, you're about to crush it, take your time. Because again, best case scenario, if you play it quickly, you're two minutes faster for your dinner. That's it. You win two <laughs> minutes of your life, three minutes. Worst case scenario, you blunder a defense and you may even lose the game. So take your time, ridiculous it may seem for, from the outside uh, players or, uh, or for your opponent. No, the price of a mistake is very high. And if you take extra a few minutes, the worst case scenario, you're a little bit hungrier. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> if you do that, worst case scenario, if you don't do it, oh boy, a lot of things could go wrong if you don't do that. So yes, uh, uh, I, I am doing, at least I'm trying my best to do it. I'm like, this is not over yet. Take your time until, until, until he, she resigns. It's not over yet. Anything can happen. So yes, that's, that's a good observation. And oh, Jesse, we lost you. Yeah, we cannot hear you. Yeah. Actually, I think uh, uh, most of us know that in theory, but the, the difficult part is applying it. <laughs> That's correct. It, it took me time to, uh, like, uh, I keep talking to myself in my head when I get a winning position. This isn't over yet. <laughs> Focus, this isn't over yet. Yeah. You didn't resign yet. <laughs> what, po what uh, or for example, another question, what could I have done? What, yeah. If you think that you're completely winning and your opponent is an idiot for not resigning, think about what could I have blundered and please don't blunder stalemate. Stalemate <laughs> is the last chance in a completely lost game. Give up all the pieces and stalemate a lone king. That's the last chance people look for when you're winning. What could I have blundered? Is there any stalemate? <laughs> this should, that's the best advice I can give. Hey, Jesse, okay. we got you back. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. There was a detail that Khan in the YouTube chat noted, and I thought when I first saw this problem, it was also huge. And that is if we go back to knight e4, queen e7, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to queen e7, you, oh, G6, the, the, G6 there's a huge, a yeah, there's a huge detail in the position, which is that the bishop on d7 is hanging. If the bishop were on c8, yeah. this whole thing really wouldn't work out nearly as well very good point so Richard. if we knight c5 gh and again if the bishop were on c8 it would would be not such a big thing but here unfortunately for black we take that thing and it's it's more than a pawn because we have knight f6 coming yes. as well so very nice detail very important one and i do want to point out the last move before this one so we unfortunately uploaded only a fan the last move was bishop takes d7 taking the knight that was the mistake queen takes right. d7 is the correct move so actually the grand master level puzzle will be the knight white's knight is on d7 the uh -huh. bishop is on c8 what do you do assuming you don't know that isn't that an easy <laughs> Isn't that an easy puzzle if we just set that up? Like, there's a knight on d7, and like, <laughs> at that point, I think, I don't know. For... Yeah, if you know it's a puzzle, and bishop d7 is such an obvious move that you would assume it's the queen, yeah, okay, maybe it's not that hard. <laughs> but yes, the hanging bishop on d7, surprisingly, is a critical, critical thing uh, for this line to work. Yeah. But during the game, that's a very tough puzzle. Yeah. Yeah. If you had no clue, oh, you yeah, yeah. and uh, it's always hard because you don't know it's a puzzle. Yeah. You just go bishop d7. You just take the pawn on c5, and then you're like, oh no. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we're gonna wrap it up here. Um, you know, behind every chess player, there is either a very um, patient woman or a patient man, and in Raluca's case, her fiance has been dying to get into the main room <laughs> going up to watch the uh, the final. And the good news for him is right now it's still scoreless. It's still scoreless. We're going to hit the half, so everything's going to be fine. All the action still to come. And I'm going to be with, watching with her fiance. <laughs> well, uh, I guess we should we should plug coachus.com one last time. That's where you guys yeah. can see all of our individual coaching profiles and book a lesson with us. Uh, it's a new site, it's very fresh and cool. I love the scheduling aspect of it that we can just put our calendars up there and students can just book any time slot that's free. They, you don't have to 
this endless back and forth. I messed oh, up so yes. many time zones. So much Gmail, with people. so many Gmail emails. <laughs> <laughs> and you <laughs> still mess up the time, yeah? I somehow <laughs> still mess up the time sometimes. <laughs> Every time. I've never had a lesson go smoothly <laughs> uh, when we got to set it up. So, um, yeah, that's very exciting. Hopefully you guys check out coachess.com. Uh, it has uh, the site is new, so they're running deals and specials on, on coaching uh, lessons and rates and stuff. Yeah, they have 50% discount. So now's the time. That's right. And, you know, also, let me just plug for today. If you're interested in seeing the guys with the glasses talk more a little bit later, <laughs> In two hours and 15 minutes, we're going to be covering games, uh, several big matchups. Several of our students, at least several of my students, are playing tonight. And so we're going to be watching. We'll just shoot, you know, just say whatever we want to say, too, during the games. But uh, <laughs> should be some great matchups. And that's going to be on our Chess Dojo Twitch. Yeah, and that's not for Europe, I guess. That's for United States viewers. It's quite quite late in two hours. Yeah, it's quite late <laughs> over there for you guys. Yeah, that's right. We're just going to be happy with the finals. With a football <laughs> tonight. <laughs> as happy as we can get. <laughs> okay. 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 Well, yeah, and hopefully, you know, we'll do this more. We might do it next week. We'll see. But I've, I've enjoyed it a lot, and I've also learned a lot. Yeah, there's more to talk about. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks.